Barbara, does he spill things at home? I just want to know. I've got to give Dave a hard time because I do. I so appreciate you men. Thank you for serving us today. Now, I set myself up last week by concluding the message with, I am going to talk about something today that perhaps is the subject that brings the most consternation to people when they hear the message on the sovereign nature of God. We've been discussing His attributes. And the attribute of God's sovereignty, when taught properly will cause people of this word to kind of recoil. It is often the primary reason they reject the God who is revealed in the pages of Scripture. It is the issue of God's sovereignty that is even the source of confusion and frustration in the lives of many believers. A number of years ago, back in the the 90s, I spoke uh, a message about the sovereignty of God. And later, after that message was over, I was having a a chat with a, a dear, sweet lady of God. And she said, I have, I don't know what you mean by sovereignty. I've never heard that word connected with God before and 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 it struck me odd because this this dear sweet Christian woman had been a believer at that time longer than I had been alive I was in my 30s she had been a Christian all of her life almost and I thought wow she has never heard anything about the sovereignty of God I I don't know what you understand about that I don't want to assume that everybody hearing this and who will watch it later on on YouTube understands what is meant by the word sovereign. So let's just begin by kind of getting on the same page as to what the term means. Now the dictionary, if you look up the word sovereign, it means chief or highest. It means supreme in power, superior in position, independent of or unlimited by anyone else. And that's a good definition. The meaning of sovereignty could be summed up this way. And, I, and I'll leave it on the screen. Hopefully you, you can write this down. It's not my own, but I thought it was well stated. Here's what we could sum up the word sovereignty to mean. To be sovereign is to possess supreme power and authority so that one is in complete control and can accomplish whatever he pleases. Similar definitions of the sovereignty of God can be found in various books on the attributes of God. I, I own a number of works that I've used for research over the years. Nobody says it better than A.W. Tozer when he writes this, God's sovereignty requires that he be absolutely free, which means simply that he must be free to do whatever he wills to do anywhere at any time to carry out his eternal purpose in every single detail without interference. Were he less than free, he must be less than sovereign. God is said to be absolutely free because no one and no thing can hinder him or compel him or stop him. He is able to do as he pleases always, everywhere, forever. To be thus free means also that he must possess universal authority, end quote. And that's well put. For God to be sovereign, folks, means that he is subject to none, influenced by none, absolutely independent of all. God does as he pleases, only as he pleases, always as he pleases. None can thwart him, none can hinder him. Amen? Amen. A.W. Pink 
in his book, The Attributes of God, says divine sovereignty means that God is God in fact as well as in name. That he is on the throne of the universe directing all things, working all things after the counsel of his own will, as it says in Ephesians 1.11. Now, virtually all Christians at least give verbal assent to the doctrine of the sovereignty of God. There are just simply too many passages in the text that teaches this truth. We, we, we could not deny it. Psalm 103, verse 19. And I'm just going to give you a few today. The Lord has established His throne in heaven and His kingdom rules over all. That's an all-encompassing statement. The Lord established His throne in heaven and, he, and His kingdom rules over all. Psalm 115, verse 3, But our God is in heaven. He does whatever He pleases. Psalm 135, verse 5 and 6. For I know that the Lord is great, and our Lord is above all gods. Whatever the Lord pleases, He does. In heaven, and in earth, in the seas, and in all the deep places. God's own word, from this is, this is the Lord speaking, Isaiah 46, Verse 10, my counsel shall stand, I will do all my pleasure. Folks, God's sovereignty over the works of his hand is just vividly depicted in Scripture. Inanimate matter, irrational creatures, all are subject to the sovereignty of God. Uh, for instance, at his pleasure... He parted the Red Sea, and the waters divided and stood up as walls. At one point, Korah, Dathan, and some of the rebel rebellers against Moses, God opened up the ground, and when they all fell in, God closed the ground back up. The ground does what God tells it to do. At one point in Joshua 10, he ordered the sun to stand still, and it stood still. And on another occasion, according to Isaiah 38, it actually back, went backwards 10 degrees on the sundial of Ahaz. He made iron to float to the top of the water in 2 Kings chapter 6. <clears throat> so, inanimate matter does what he tells it to do. But even irrational creatures like birds, he, he made ravens bring food to the prophet Elijah. Uh, he caused the lion's mouths to be shut when Daniel was put into a den. He caused fire not to burn the three Hebrews who were flung into the flames by an angry king, Nebuchadnezzar. And in the New Testament, he made a fish cough up tax money. <laughs> Makes me want to go fishing on April 15th. <laughs> Psalm 135, 6, we just looked at it, sums it up. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and in earth, in the seas and in all the deep places. He just, nothing hinders him from accomplishing what he wants to accomplish, whether it's dirt, whether it's water, whether it's a jackass talking to Balaam or a jackass talking to you. He can do whatever he wants. I'm going to get cards, aren't I? <laughs> Folks, in a world that's reluctant to even acknowledge the existence of God, we should not expect the unbeliever to embrace the doctrine of God's sovereignty. We should expect that a Christian would embrace the doctrine of the sovereignty of God as being both biblical and true. Folks, we, we must look at this attribute and say, in fact, God is completely and totally 
sovereign over everything. Now listen, a lot of Christians believe the principle, but not really in practice. They don't act like, they don't sound like they really believe in the sovereignty of God. We give lip service to it. God is sovereign, he's in control, but just let the bottom fall out of your life. Let something happen, right? Because life sometimes, folks, the rubber meets the road with our faith, and we really kind of see just where we stand in our belief system about God, don't we? Richard Strauss writes in his book, The Joy of Knowing God. He says this, God is truly and perfectly sovereign. That means he is the highest and greatest being there is. He controls everything. His will is absolute, and he does whatever he pleases. When we hear that stated, we can understand it reasonably well, and we can usually handle it until God allows something that we do not like then our normal reaction is to resist the doctrine of sovereign, his sovereignty. Rather than finding comfort in it, we find that it gets us upset with God. If he can do whatever he pleases, why does he allow us to suffer? Our problem is a misunderstanding of the doctrine and an inadequate knowledge of God, end quote. He is absolutely spot on. The unbeliever... If you start talking to them and they're saying, how could God allow 9-11? How could God allow my next door neighbor's little child? Why didn't God stop this from happening? And then it goes on. A noted atheist, Richard Dawkins, he wrote a book called The God Delusion. The paper in the book would make good birdcage lining. But he says this, quote, listen to this, it's going to make you angry. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all of fiction. Jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving, control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, philicidal, pestilential, megalomaniac, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully, end quote. Some big words in there. Yeah, the, the, wor the world would look at the Bible and they go, this is the God you say is a God of love? He opens up the ground and swallows people. He sends the Israelites and tells them to wipe every man, woman, and child and animal out. This is the God you're trying to convince me is a God of great mercy and grace. Folks, it's vitally important for every Christian to understand the doctrine of the sovereignty of God. This is one of his attributes. And the attribute of God's sovereignty, it troubles many people and it troubles a lot of Christians. This is the one attribute that many believers find it the most difficult to submit to. This is the particular aspect of God that many often fight against. This is where rebellion often finds its beginning. We do not like submitting to His sovereignty. Submitting to the sovereign of the universe is most difficult when his ways cut across the grain of our well-laid plans. Right? You with me so far? But the sovereignty of God is crucial because it's taught in the Bible and because it really is the basis for godly living. We must look to the Word of God and the Spirit of God to teach us what we need to know about God's sovereignty. Now, you might be surprised to find that one of the best definitions of God's sovereignty doesn't come from the mouth of Moses or one of the great prophets of the Old Testament. And the, a good definition of the sovereignty of God doesn't even come from the Apostle Paul who wrote two-thirds of your New Testament. Surprisingly, the clearest definition of God's sovereignty comes from the lips of a man named Nebuchadnezzar who was a pagan king of Babylon. 
And there we, listen, and, and when we look at this, you're not going to find a begrudging acknowledgement of God's sovereignty, but you're going to see an acknowledgement that, ex, that is expressed in, the, in worship and praise of His sovereignty. Now, let me just take you to the book of Daniel, chapter 4. And verse 28, and all of this came upon Nebuchadnezzar. Now, Hold on right there, because you, your first question when you read verse 28 is all of what came upon him. Well, if you go to the first 27 verses, here's what happens. Nebuchadnezzar has what is called his second dream. And his dream is basically this. He has this dream that there was this massive tree. Matter of fact, he says in, the, in his dream, this tree was so big, it could be seen from the ends of the earth. It reached to the heavens. It was so big in his dream that anywhere on the planet could look and see that tree. And the birds of the air gathered into its branches and got shade from them. And the beasts of the earth were underneath it. And it provided fruit for all of the people of the earth. And then in his dream, he, he notices some watchers. There's some angels that come down. And they say, cut the tree down. Leave the stump, leave the roots, take the tree down. The birds no longer have a place to lodge. It says, and then bind it with shackles. And it'll, it will feed on grass like an ox for seven years. This is all in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And so he calls his magicians and his sorcerers in, and they can't tell him what the dream's about. But then he remembers Daniel, who interpreted his first dream, head of gold, chest of bronze, arms and legs, or, or legs of, of uh, clay, and so on and so forth. Get, get Daniel. Belteshazzar is the name he was given by Nebuchadnezzar. Calls Daniel in. Daniel hears this dream and Daniel goes, oh, king, I wish this was talking about some of your enemies, but this is what it's talking about. You, your kingdom is going to be drawn up short. As a matter of fact, you're going to become like an ox, and you're going to be out to pasture <laughs> for seven years. This is what's going to happen to you. And so Daniel explains that dream to him, and all of that that Daniel explains in verse 28, all of this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 29, at the end of 12 months, so it's been a year, Daniel said, this is what's going to happen, but you know, time passes, you kind of go, well, it's not going to happen this week. A year's passed, at the end of 12 months, he's walking about the royal palace of Babylon, and the king spoke saying, is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? You ever been full of yourself? Yeah. The king said all of this, and he says, while the word was still in his mouth. He hadn't even finished the sentence. <laughs> A voice fell from heaven, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you, and they will drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make you eat grass like oxen, and seven times, that means years, seven times shall pass over you until you know, here's, what he, here's the lesson, that the Most High God, what? Rules. You're not near as big a potato chip as you think you are. You're going to know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. And that very hour the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men and he ate, great, he ate grass like oxen and his body was wet with the dew of heaven until his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird claws. Now think about it. He is out for seven years like a wild beast in the pasture. I thank God for his amazing graze. <laughs> You'll understand what I mean. His amazing grace. 
At the end of that time, verse 34, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes to heaven and my understanding returned to me. And look who he's blessing now. And I bless the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever for his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. Here's that, here's that definition of sovereignty. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? This man gets it, right? Listen, this acknowledgement of God's of the sovereignty of God is made by a man who, who knew more about human sovereignty than any of us in America could ever understand. Uh, among the human kings of history, this king, Nebuchadnezzar, is referred to in chapter 2 of Daniel, verse 37, as the king of kings. He is pictured in his first vision in uh, chapter 2, verse 38, as the head of gold. And all of the subsequent kingdoms that come after him are considered inferior. Silver, bronze, iron, and clay mixed with iron. There is a degrading pattern of, 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 of importance he is the head of gold. This is the king who understood human sovereignty, at least in a certain... He's never been like God in his sovereignty. But in comparison with his kingdom, the remaining world empires are described as inferior. And later on, Daniel would talk to a man by the name of Shazar, who was Nebuchadnezzar's son. This is after Nebuchadnezzar's gone from the scene. And Daniel speaks to him and describes to Belshazzar, the extent of his father Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. Chapter 5, verse 18, O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. And because of the majesty that he gave him, all the peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whomever he wished, he executed. Whomever he wished, he kept alive. Whomever he wished, he sat up. And whomever he wished, he put down. This, this man, in human terms, was the greatest sovereign king that the world has ever known. He could rule... He could say, I want you dead, and you're dead. He wants to lift you up and put you into a place of honor. He can do that. He wants to take you down. He can take you down. Now, in our world, we have no political leader or ruler who even approaches the kind of human sovereignty we see in Nebuchadnezzar. The office of the President of the United States is a position of great power, no doubt, but it is not an example of human sovereignty. Now, I want you to notice the difference between Nebuchadnezzar from verse 30 and the one at the end of the chapter. In verse 30, remember he said this, Is not this the great Babylon that I have built for the royal dwelling for my, by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? That's verse 30. And then verse 36, And at the same time my reason returned to me and the glory of my kingdom, my honor and my splendor returned to me. I got it all back. My counselors, my nobles resorted to me once again. People started coming to me but. Because of my position, I was restored to my kingdom, and the excellent majesty was added to me. But instead of being all puffed up about it, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all of whose works are truth, and his ways justice in those who walk in pride. He's able to make, or he's able to put them down. You see, what Nebuchadnezzar learned a lesson about the sovereignty of Almighty God. And folks, listen, this illustrates why it is absolutely so vital that we have a proper understanding of what it means to acknowledge that God is sovereign. Write this verse down, Job 42, verse 2. Great verse. I know that you can do, say that word, and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. Now, we can talk about the sovereignty of God, and we could take this topic in a number of directions. 
We could talk about the sovereignty of God as it relates to to the election of those who will be saved. The scriptures clearly teach that God has elected certain people to obtain salvation. Paul said this in 2 Timothy chapter 2, Therefore I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. We could talk about the sovereignty of God in election. We could talk about the sovereignty of God in government. We saw that by the, the, the acknowledgement of Nebuchadnezzar. He sets up one, he takes down another. He's able to make the, the lowliest of men a king. God does that. We see in Romans that the rulers who are set up, they're appointed by God. He actually calls them his servants. He, I, I hate to tell you this, but the president and the governors, they're appointed by God. You think you, you, vote, you didn't vote for him? God's going to carry out his purpose, folks. I, we could talk about God in, in terms of healing. There are some who claim that they can command God to do whatever they want Him to do. They've made themselves sovereign and God's servant. And they can name and claim and say, well, if I say this in Jesus' name, God has to do. God doesn't have to do anything that's not according to His purpose and design. You cannot bind God's hands and force Him to do something. We could talk about the, the sovereignty of God as it relates to healing. Uh, uh, folks, listen, but I want us to spend the remainder of our time just considering the sovereignty of God in a world that's just overrun with suffering and evil, because that seems to be the big one. That's where people really stumble with this. I think one of the reasons for biblical skeptics and, and, and theological liberals and their inability to accept Scripture is they cannot resolve the issue of God being good and loving and all-knowing and wise and kind and all-powerful, and then the world being dominated by evil in all kinds of forms. And, it, and they cannot connect the dots. And it causes them to struggle and become very cynical. I mean, You've heard it, or you will hear it if you talk to anybody, especially following uh, maybe a, a disaster or some horrible thing that's happened. If God is so powerful and He's so loving, why, why, why does He allow this? Or, or why didn't He put a stop to that? Why does He allow evil to continue to exist? And folks, you, you can try to come up with some kind of glib answer. You just got to be careful. You can't go, well, hey, God didn't do it. It's not God's fault. It, it, you know, it, Adam and Eve were the ones who made the sin come into the world and, and all that. But listen, you, you, you can't say that because well, the question is, why did God allow Adam and Eve to, the option of making sinful choices? He created them. Why did he even allow that? And if God knew they were going to make those kinds of choices, then why didn't he just make people who were incapable of making those kinds of choices? See, that answer doesn't help. And you certainly can't say, well, God's not the one responsible for the evil, it's the devil. Which then only poses the question, why did God create an angel, knowing the angels knowing that they would fall? That one of them would become the devil and lead the whole human race into sin. We, we can't say the devil makes us do it, Right? No, you, you can't say that. That's no help at all. I mean, if God knew he was going to make all those choices and lead to these issues, why, why did he make Lucifer? I mean, this is the kind of questions that, that, these are philosophical things that I realize. But since he's the creator who created them from nothing, he could have made them any way he wanted to make them, right? Well, yeah, yeah. So yeah, those answers don't help. You can't, you, you got to go you got to go beyond Adam and Eve. You even have to go beyond Satan. Folks, any, any answer to those questions, if you can, if you can come up with a, a, an answer, understand this. All the answers that are legitimate will ultimately lead us back to God. It's got to get us to God. You can't stop asking the question at Satan or even Adam and Eve. If you really want an answer to the question about evil, everything ultimately goes back to the nature of God and, listen, the purposes of God. Now let me start with something that everyone in this room, I think, will agree with. Evil exists. Right? We in agreement with that? Unless you happen to belong to you know, Christian science, which is neither Christian nor science. 
You follow the teachings of Mary Baker Eddy, who said evil is an illusion. The, unless you're part of that weird group, you acknowledge evil exists, and it exists on a number of levels, doesn't it? Evil exists just what we would call natural evil. There's just natural evil. This is not a personal issue. It's part of being in this created order that's, that's fallen. It's impersonal. It's external to us. We have diseases and tiny bacteria and viruses. We have disasters and earthquakes and volcanic eruptions and tsunamis and hurricanes and tornadoes. This planet, it's a dangerous place to live, right? Some of you are allergic to bees. You get stung with a bee and you don't have the, whatever that stuff, what's that stuff called? Thank you. You don't have that stuff. You could die from a little bitty sting. This is a dangerous world. There are natural evils. It's dangerous. Just natural evil in the world. Romans 8 says that the whole of creation is groaning, waiting for the day of when it will be made right again. But it, that's not bad enough. Then you have moral evil, right? Not, natural evil is bad enough, but moral evil is personal, internal. It's spiritual. It isn't dominates the whole human race. <laughs> this kind of moral evil, folks, is pervasive. I don't got to sell you on this. It's in every single human heart. And it is a dominating and controlling force in our world. There's none who understands. There's none who seeks after God. They're all gone out of the way. They're together become unprofitable. There's none who does good. How many? No, not one. And Jeremiah said, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So, the world is not only just naturally dangerous, you add to that it's inhabited by people who are evil to the core morally. Fallen sinful humanity is trying to survive in a fallen world and it expresses itself in dysfunctional marriages, dysfunctional families, Friendships that disintegrate, rivalries that escalate into wars. And all these things simply reflect the fact that moral evil exists in the world. But it's worse than those two things. Because you also have supernatural evil to contend with. There is not only the evil that's in the heart of man, but folks, there's a force of demonic beings who by disposition and nature are corrupt. They're evil spirits and they're liars and they're deceivers. And John says in 1 John 5, 19, that the whole world lies in the lap. Meaning it lies under the sway of the wicked one. This is a pretty bad world to live in. <laughs> you got natural calamity, you got moral disintegration, and then you've got this supernatural force that's infecting people's lives. And God sometimes even allows that. We learn that in the book of Job. Gave Satan permission, sovereignty, you can only go this far. You can do this much and no more. Satan's on his leash. Sovereign even over what Satan does. We see it from Job. We see it in Peter. Devil's like a roaring lion seeking who may devour. Hey, Jesus told Peter, hey, Satan wants to sift you like wheat, but I prayed for you. Satan's trying to do something. Even Paul, who was given a messenger of Satan to buffet him, to keep him humble. So you have evil on a natural level. You have evil on a human level, moral evil. And then you have evil on a supernatural level. Well, the force of demons who uses their power to seduce and deceive humanity and to fight the purposes of God. Whew. It's just hard to get, just to live for Jesus some days, isn't it? Yeah. Evil's not just present in our world, folks. It's pervasive. It's dominant. It's outside us. <laughs> it's in us. It's all around us. So we start with an obvious. E evil exists, and it exists on a number of levels. But let's plug in something to encourage us a little bit. God exists. Woo! We need that. The Scripture tells us that He is the only God, and according to Scripture, He's absolutely sovereign. He's absolutely in charge of everything. He controls everything. He is governing history. Every minute detail of history is in His control. Listen, there is not 
There is not one molecule in the universe that is out of line with his purpose. That's big to think about, isn't it? We saw it in Daniel 435. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, hey, what have you done? He has to answer to nobody. Now listen, if you're having trouble accepting the sovereignty of God, that he's in absolute control of everything, I invite you to spend a little time just pondering the idea that he's not in charge of everything. That's a terrifying thought. To think that there is a power that actually can eclipse God. That all the evil we see going on, that God has somehow whew, lost control of this one. Think about that for a while. That's scarier than the fact that he's sovereign. Amen? Amen. Yeah, don't be mistaken. Now listen to me. God is absolutely holy. He cannot do evil. He cannot look upon evil positively, the Bible says. His eyes are too pure to behold iniquity. He's the God who is incapable of doing anything evil. However, God is content to leave the responsibility for evil's existence and even its actions with himself. Now that's huge. And that's going to cause some of you to go, wait, 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 where are you going with this? In Deuteronomy 23, verse 29, Now see that I... Even I am He, and there is no God beside me. I kill, I make alive, I wound, I heal. There is no one who can deliver out of my hand. Listen, God says, look, there's evil. And and listen, when people start saying, how can God be loving and do this? You know what? You don't have to go to God's defense. God's not looking for for an advocate for, for you to try to improve His reputation. God, it would seem, is not trying to protect himself or his reputation from the idea that he might actually have ordained and purpose evil. He has a purpose for it. Job is in the midst of that suffering. If you've ever read Job, that, you know, he had a lot of things happening to him. Lost family, health, everything. And, and to make it matters worse, God took his children but didn't take his wife. <laughs> and she was something else on a stick. Why don't you curse God and die, Job? Well, wonderful wife to have. You know? And Job has gone through all of this stuff. He's in the midst of his suffering. But I want you to see something he says. Verse 13, Job 23. And he's speaking about God. He says, God is unique. The word simply means he stands alone. And who can make him change? And whatever his soul desires, that's what he does. And look at this. For he performs, don't miss this, he performs what is appointed for me, and many such things are with him. Job is acknowledging, even what I'm going through has been appointed to me. God God has appointed this. God gave permission somewhere in the vast universe that this could happen to me. Job is trying to get a hold of this. And this this really sounds familiar because the Apostle Paul told the Thessalonian Christians they were a young church. They hadn't been together very long. And Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians, he's concerned about them. And he writes back to them and he says this, look, that no one of you should be shaken by these afflictions. Look at this. For you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. Why does God allow us to suffer? There's an appointment. For in fact, we told you before when we were with you that we would suffer tribulation just as it has happened and you know. Listen, I'm God, did, did God allow that tribulation to come on the Thessalonians? Yes. Does that make God responsible for it? Yeah. He, yeah, I let it happen. I didn't create it, but I let it happen. There's a passage in 1 Samuel. Stay with me. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 6 to 8. 
These passages are just dripping with the truth of God being sovereign over everyone and everything, whether it's good or whether it's evil. Verse 6, the Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and then he brings up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and lifts up. He raises the poor from the dust. He lifts up the beggar from the ash heap to set him among princes. And he makes them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the Lord, the pillars of of the earth are the Lord's, and he has set the world upon them. Listen, whether it's good or whether it's bad, God ultimately says, I take responsibility for it. Yeah, I created everything. I didn't create evil. And we could philosophize about it, and all we're going to wind up doing is chasing our tail. We can't know what caused evil to enter in. But God says, I've created everything. I'll take responsibility for it. Amos chapter 3, verse 6, If a trumpet is blown in the city, will not the people be afraid? If there is calamity in a city, will not the Lord have done it? Really? Yeah, he takes responsibility. He's taken full responsibility for the existence of evil since he is God and he controls everything. But listen to me, listen. Evil is no disruption of God's purposes, right? Whatever evil has been here and will come here, and it's going to get worse, read the book of Revelation. It never is a disruption to God's purposes. Now listen, God did not create evil, but He allows it to exist. And folks, it is not detrimental to Him carrying, about, carrying out all of His desires and all of His purposes. I find comfort in that. I find comfort in that because of Romans 8, 28. God is able to work all things, not just good things, all things together for good to them who love Him, to them who are the called ones according to His purpose. That means no matter what befalls me, He doeth all things well. As it relates to me, Job would come to this conclusion. Yet though he slay me, yet will I serve him. He understood the sovereignty of God, and he understood it well enough that he he submitted himself. This is appointed to me, as as, as all such things are. He understood that. Isaiah 45, I'm giving you a lot of scripture today. Isaiah 45, verse 5, I am the Lord, there is no other, there is no God beside me, I will gird you, though you have not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun to its setting that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is no other. I form the light and I create darkness. I make peace and I create calamity. I, the Lord, do all these things. Wow. Folks, A lot of bad things happen, and a lot of bad things happen to good people, and a lot of good things happen to bad people. But no matter what, God is not hindered or thwarted in fulfilling His purpose. I am as concerned for our nation as I have ever been. Teresa and I pray every night. My alarm on my phone goes off. We stop whatever we're doing. We pray. Tonight, when we meet, we're going to meet back there. We're going to pray for our nation. I hope some of you are burdened to come and pray for our nation. But I know this. When we're done and we say, in Jesus' name, amen, Lord, not our will be done, but thine be done. And yours is the kingdom and the glory, both now and forever. And we walk away with joy, knowing no matter what happens, God is in control. Now, folks, the worst evil, the most heinous of sin that has ever been perpetrated by man was the brutal murder of the Son of God. That was the epitome of wickedness. He knew no sin, neither was any guile found in his mouth, and yet he was treated with such contempt and scourged and died. And yet... And yet, Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 22, Peter says, Men of Israel, 
Hear these words. Thousands of them around him. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did through him in your midst as you yourself well know. Him, Christ, look at this, being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. You have taken by lawless hands and have crucified and put to death. God is sovereign even over the most wicked things that have, the thing that has ever happened. Jesus did not die a victim. He was the lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world. It fit within God's purposes. Listen, our, we look at our world condition and our world is a dangerous place because of natural evils that happen. Uh, we saw that just this past week in the devastating tornado that went through Rolling Fork, Mississippi and Alabama this past week. Just natural evils that hit and people are, have died and, and homes have been devastated and we, we saw that. And folks, we also saw that our world is disintegrating morally. We have another fresh reminder of the pervasiveness of the moral evil and the senseless murder at the school in Nashville. And folks, our world is collapsing economically. Things cannot simply go on this trajectory that it's on without a global economic disaster. And the, the threat of another of a, of a global war always looms on the horizon as we watch nation after nation developing weapons of mass destruction and in the midst of all of this. There sits one on a throne, a king, who's absolutely sovereign over it all. Amen. Psalm 33, the Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He makes the plans of the peoples of no effect. The counsel of the Lord stands forever, the plans of his heart to all generations. Isn't that encouraging? So let's ask the big question. God is sovereign. So what? What does, that, what does that do? I mean, in light of all the evil that is permeating our world, we must understand and acknowledge that the sovereign God of the universe oversees and even purposes the evil that sin has caused in His creation. So, number one. So what? Relax. God's got this. Okay? Paul said in Philippians 4, Be anxious, worried, fretful about nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And look what happens. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will, keep your, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. We need that today. We look at the evil, natural evil, moral evil, demonic evil, the world is just coming apart at the seams. I tell you what holds us together mentally, emotionally, spiritually is my God's got this, right? Kathy sent me something this week. Thank you for this. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, great quote. When you go through a trial, the sovereignty of God is the pillow upon which you lay your head. You can sleep at night because my God's in absolute control. So relax. God's got this. Number two, rejoice. The Lord God omnipotent, all-powerful reigns. Right? In Revelation chapter 19, verse 6. Hallelujah for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Verse 7, let us be glad and rejoice and give Him glory. Right? Yeah, He reigns. And this is right before the world goes to hell in a handbasket in the book of Revelation. And what is he saying? Lord God, omnipotent reigns. Rejoice. <laughs> we can rejoice. Jesus had just spoke of, of all the evils that are coming on the world in the tribulation period in Luke chapter 21. And, and he has just laid out the horrible calamities, the earthquakes, the famines, the pestilence, and all of that stuff. And he's just laid it out. And this is how he kind of brings it to a conclusion. Now, when these things begin to happen, guys, talking to his disciples, look up, lift up your heads, 
because your redemption draws near. You know what? I'm going to keep my head looking up. I'm going to keep it focused. I'm going to look to the hills from whence cometh my help. Amen? Amen? Let me tell you something. Evil exists, but not forever. The book ends. Read, read the end of the story. Revelation 21. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Evil will someday cease to exist. Peter said it this way, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, we look for a new heavens and a new earth. And I love this. In which dwells righteousness. Righteousness is going to permeate the new heavens and the new earth. Right now, evil seems to permeate. Someday, that's all gone. We'll have nothing to cry about. You won't have to sit through my sermons anymore, so you can quit being aggravated that I'm going long. Listen, there'll be no more pain, no more suffering, no more sorrow. So rejoice. There is an end in sight. I've read the book. God wins. Amen? Amen. All right. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. It encourages us, Father, to know you're on the throne. We can lay our head down at night knowing that the sovereign God is still on the throne He's still worthy of all honor and praise and glory and power and dominion, both now and forever. But, Father, there are some in this room who have never bowed the knee to Jesus. They have never repented of their sinfulness. And they stand on the threshold of hell and the wrath of God. And today, Lord, you can bring them to yourself and rescue them from the flames that someday will engulf them if they continue in their sin. Only you can save a soul. There may be some here in this room this morning that need to bow the knee to Christ. I pray they would get saved today. Lord, for those of us who know you, I hope that we've been encouraged by a reminder that you have got this. May we live for you today and tomorrow and from now on with our heads looking up, our hearts filled with joy, even in the midst of a crooked and a perverse generation. We need to live differently. Thank you, Father, in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. We're going to dismiss. I want you to stand with me just for a moment. Be patient and I'll let you go. After a message like this, I don't want to just let you walk out those doors without offering you an invitation. Not my invitation, it's God's invitation. Some of you are are being convicted of your sin right now. You know if you died today, you would not go to heaven. There's no reason to leave this building in that condition. Today, if you hear his voice, he's speaking to your heart. The Bible says, don't harden your hearts. If you hear his voice speaking to you, you know you're a sinful person and you need to repent and turn to Christ. I am going to be up here. My wife is here. Brother Dave is here. We've got Bill here. We've got Kathy over here. We've got a number of people who will be glad to meet with you and pray with you and tell you how you can have a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. What he did on the cross, what we remembered earlier in the service. If that is your situation right now, Please, please don't walk out those doors the same way you came in. Not when eternal life is being offered freely for those who by faith will trust what Jesus did on the cross. When I pray right now and I dismiss, you come forward if that's what you need. The rest of you, enjoy one another's fellowship. Make sure you greet our guests and visitors. But for those of you who need Christ... I'm going to wait up here for a few moments, and I invite you, God invites you, whosoever will, let them come, Jesus said.
Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord can be saved. Come today and call on Jesus. Father, right now, your Holy Spirit is moving in this place. Bring those whom you have ordained to eternal life. Bring them forward today to trust Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.